right. So we we'll kind of get started here in just a second. One thing I wanted to point out before I started this is that kind of next connect assignment is up there on Canvas. So you can kind of start chipping away at that. Uh, as we cover the material, probably after today, be able to, I don't know, I don't know I'm quite halfway through it, but about halfway through the problems. Um, and then I should be doing a little bit of Excel work today. Uh, depending on how, how far we get, I might post the first or the next Excel assignment um, after class today. If we don't get too far into it, I might wait and do it after Wednesday. Uh, for sure, after Wednesday, we'll cover kind of everything you'll need for that next Excel assignment. So that's kind of what's coming up in the near future. Okay. Any questions for me before we kind of jump into material here today? So the next week's lecture slide should be up there on Canvas, just kind of under the files tab. Um, now, where we left off, and actually, that's one more thing I'll show you before we get going. So I put up, I put a notes up yesterday. But the standard normal or these Z tables, right? Kind of from here on out, making sure you have these printed out um, and that you can kind of have them pulled up in front of you or, um, you know, on your computer or your laptop or at least have them printed because we'll be using them in a class. But it's, you can kind of see a little bit difficult. It's a little bit small up here for you guys to read. So it's easier to have it, have it there in front of you. Um, but we will be using those like, I don't say the rest of the semester, but almost the rest of the semester uh, at various points in time. Okay. Any questions for me before you turn on the things you do? So, where did we leave off? I think I just kind of, we discussed these four, right? We have these normally distributed variables. We convert them into standard normally distributed variables. So, it looks something like this where I've got this normally distributed variable X. We said there's all types of normal distributions and they're defined by whatever their mean is and whatever their variance or standard deviation is. So if I'm then interested in what's the probability I see a certain X value, or let's say anything below it, well, what I'll need to do is turn that normally distributed variable into a standard normally distributed variable. We said the way that we can do that is subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. Once I turn that X value, whatever it ends up being into a Z score, so that's all that subscript means there's just whatever X value I'm turning into a Z score. I can then look it up in that standard normal table and it will tell me the area to the left of that. Right? Or essentially, the, the probability I saw this value for my original variable x or anything below it. So just to kind of a refresher of how we do that, um, in fact, I'm going to skip ahead here. I think I have these out of order. Um, so let's say I, I figure out that this is 2.53, right? negative 2.53. What would the probability that I see negative 2.53 or anything below it be? Or what's the probability I saw an x value that was... 2.53 standard deviations below. Remember, that's the interpretation of our z-score is the number of standard deviations below the mean. So, I'll come back here in a second. All right, so I will zoom in just a little bit. So we've got negative 2.53. Well, these are the positive values. Now, right away, before I even go over to the table to look this up, why did... Um, if I have something a number of standard deviations below the mean, what do I automatically know this probability has to be less than? What would the probability of seeing the mean or anything below it be? Yeah, we said this mean was the same as the median because we have a symmetric distribution. The z score of the mean should always be what? How many standard deviations? Yeah, how many standard deviations away from the mean is the mean? Zero standard deviations away, right? It's exactly equal to the mean. So we know that this area we're looking for has to be something that's less than 0.5. Okay. But you know, we actually want to go through the process of finding exactly what it is. So negative 2.5 was our first decimal value. The hundredth place, negative 2.53, so 0 0.03. 
So negative 2.53. We'll probably have seen that value or anything below it. It's 0 0.0057. Okay. So the way I use that table, remember, is to look up the first decimal of your z score value as your row heading, and then your column heading is the second decimal. Okay. So essentially, this table is our cumulative density, right? The probability of seeing that z value or anything below it to the left. Okay. Any questions yet? Um, for the z formula, is uh, x and n going to you? Yeah, so, right, this is I'm not very good at drawing this, right? This is mu, right? This just represents our mean. Um, so this is going to be something like I'll show you in Excel today. If I have a column of data, I can pretty easily in Excel or by hand if I wanted to calculate the mean and the standard deviation, right? X is just going to be different values. So yeah, they're going to be given to you in the sense that you're going to be interested in what's the probability that I see, you know, if I select somebody at random, what's the probability that their height is over, I don't know, 62 inches or something like that, right? It'll be an actual value that you're, you're given. Kind of like when we were doing with the discrete random variables, and we said, what's the probability X is equal to some little value X? That's what we're saying here, right? Usually it was like, two successes or five successes or whatever it was. Here, it's going to be an actual value that's given to us. Yeah. And we'll work through some problems here in just a second. I'm just kind of getting used to kind of the Z-score idea looking it up. Any other questions on that? So, if I know the probability of Multiple time is style of visit. Wow, I'll do it right now. I'm not going to expect you guys to go to that. I'm not going to do any extra credit or kind of require that you go to one. Um, but I would suggest, and we're not going to have class canceled, but I would suggest if you have kind of some time available, if you look at that schedule. This is the way that I think about it. Yes. So I think it's really valuable. Um, the things I'll talk about in your industry. Um, but the real value is network. So if it were me, what I would suggest doing, look at what topics or whatever's going to be talked about. Try to find the things that are most related to something that you think that you would want to work in, right? So if there's one about healthcare or something, and you're kind of interested in that, you know, healthcare, go to that one, right? But choose a couple of them, two, two, maybe three, that are kind of related to something that you could see yourself doing in terms of your career, your job. And then as awkward as it is, and as difficult as it is, afterwards, if it were me, I'd go up and introduce myself to that person. So the people that are speaking are almost all alumni who are coming back for a reason, not because it's fun, they're not getting paid to do it, right? They're doing it because they like to come back and talk to the students. And a lot of them are in positions in companies where they might be able to know some internship opportunities down the road. So I've seen a couple of students who I know. I, so I work with the economic advisory board and I heard firsthand from them. that a few of them were approached after some of these dialogue based sessions and a handful of students who approached them lo and behold end up with some internship opportunities out of that. So I know it's that cold, but it's cold blind go up and talk to some people. No, um, that would be my, I think it's most valuable thing in politics. I'm playing that. We'll talk about interesting things, you get a lot out of that. The real thing that you can benefit you is just trying to make those those connections, network, um, and talk to those people out. Yeah, that's my spiel on that. That's part. I'm glad, I'm glad I had to get that down. So it reminded me of that. So if I look up that z value of negative two point five three, I just said I found this area here, point zero zero five seven. So if I want the probability of seeing that z score or anything above it. What is the only other thing that I have to do? One minus. Remember, the area under this curve is always one. So if I know this is 0 0.0057, this area has to be one minus that. So anytime we wonder the probability of being greater than a certain value, it's just one added step. Right, you got to you look the probability up in the table, but then you have one more step, which is you have to subtract it from one because the table only gives you, always only gives you the area to the left. Okay, but the probability of seeing that value or anything below it. So that first kind of slide had they skipped over had the probability of being greater than or equal to negative two point five. So that would be one minus point 
zero zero five seven should be what point nine nine four three, and then we kind of said the problem being less than that was the point zero zero five seven. Okay, for kind of following on how we look those up. Just want to have a couple of numbers to, to kind of point those things out. Um, I think I showed you these last class kind of um, I had the survey data with human height, one of these variables that just ends up being pretty normally distributed. Uh, if we've got a cross to put this stuff out, we have some workout they had, and I mean, almost spot on to normal distribution. Uh, I had some powerlifting data uh, that I moved that. I probably moved it at the end. I guess, I guess I'll hold off on that session, but I have some powerlifting data that kind of shows some human performance stuff where we see it follow really close to normal distribution as well. So it's kind of interesting to see how much this pops up, especially in biological measures, the biological metrics, right? So all of these different distributions, right? The power of the data, the product, the human height, they're all normally distributed, but their means and their variances are all very different. So if we start out with this random variable X, and it's not standard normally distributed, where it has a mean of zero and a variance of one, we're gonna to have to go through this process where we convert that normally distributed variable into a standard normally distributed variable and then kind of use our table to find the problem being above or below a certain value. So, you know, just kind of in general, I'll go through this quick because I think it makes more sense to see if we're through an actual example that has some numbers to it. But let's say I want to know the probability I'm in between two values, right? So in between A and B. Okay. So my first step, well, you know, what's the probability I'm in between A and B? All right, and this is for my random variable x. I don't know why this isn't raising very well, but hopefully you can see this okay. If you need any clarification, let me know. So we're the first step we're going to do is think about I need to turn these two values that I'm interested in into z values. Okay. So that's the first step. Anytime we are wanting to know the probability being above, below, or between two values. We need to turn those values that were from a normally distributed variable into a standard normally distributed variable. How do we do that? Well, we just subtract the mean and divide the standard deviation, divide by the standard deviation for each of those values, whatever they happen to be A and B, it could be 5 and 10, 23 and 49, right? Whatever those two values end up being. Okay. So once I find these Z values, right, I can look up, or I guess here I, I said. The next step, and you can kind of flip one and two. I flipped them here. I drew out the region I was looking for initially. I always think it just kind of helps to have a visual. Usually, if you wanted to, you know, once you know where these Z values are, it's a little bit easier to plot them after the fact. Generally, I, I have a good grasp on this already, so I kind of know where to plot them ahead of time. But sometimes it makes more sense to calculate them first. Then you would know, you know, which side of zero they're on. So it's probably a little bit more appropriate to follow the steps and calculate the z values first, then try to kind of draw what your distribution will look like and what region you're looking for. Now, I wanted the probability of being in between both of these z values. So I can use that standard normal table to look up the relevant probabilities that I'm going to need. So I think I, I went through this with the idea of a cumulative density function. If I'm trying to find the probability that I'm in between, these two z values, how could I use that table to do that? Yeah, so not just subtract the values though, right? Yeah. I have to look up this z value on my standard normal table. That would give me the area to the left of that. I then go look up the next z value, right? If I subtract this smaller area from the larger area, all I'm left with is what's in between, which is what I originally wanted. So when maybe an easier non as I guess kind of visual way to think about that. If I've got, I want the probability I'm in between two values, I'll find the probability associated with each z-score and subtract the smaller probability from the larger one. That's adds, adds more of a, and then you're not so technical way of looking at remembering how to do it. Okay. And kind of this fourth step, that process of subtracting one from the other, we'll sometimes have to, Call it that fourth step. Once we look at the relevant probability, we have a little bit of math to do, right? Now, if I just want the probability of being less than a certain value, I'm done at step three, right? The table tells me that. But when I wanted the probability of being above a certain value, I had kind of one more step, which is subtract that probability from one. If I wanted the probability of being in between two values, my additional step was I have to subtract that smaller probability from the larger probability I looked up. 
Yeah. All right. So let's work through some some actual values here and see if we can get a little better idea of how to do this. Okay. So it's basically going to be the same setup here. Actually, I can do some of the board. Um, well, let's say I want to know. I'm going to stop using the black one because I feel like it's not a race very long. So let's say I want to know the probability that I'm in between 10 and 15. Right? So I can go ahead and graph this first. Um, I could first turn those values into z scores and then graph them, but I think just to kind of help you have a more comprehensive view of what we're doing. It's a little bit easier to think about both the original normally distributed variable x as well as that standard normal distribution once we turn it into these values. So here, what's the mean of my random variable x? So we're told that it's normally distributed and it's got a mean of five and a variance of 25. Okay? So this is generally how we're kind of given information about normal distribution. It always makes more sense to think about things through the idea or the lens of the standard deviation. Because eventually, once we turn values into z scores, they're going to be the number of standard deviations away. So, here, what would my standard deviation be? Just the square root of the variance, right? Or we have a variance of 25 with a standard deviation of 5. So, this is kind of a unique example. I end up kind of with the same mean and the same variance. Sorry, I'm going to read that. That was supposed to be 5. So, here I want to know what's the probability I see this random variable x be somewhere in between 10 and 15. Okay. Right away, what do I know this probability has to be less than? So this is kind of one of those tricks that will really help you kind of prevent yourself from making a really easy mistake on anything. What does this probability have to be less than? This is the mean. What's the area to the right of the mean? 0.5. Oh, yeah. Where is the left and the right of the mean? Exactly splits in half, right? So 0.5 is on either side. If this area is 0.5, once I draw this out right away, I can easily see this is definitely going to be something smaller than 0.5. Okay. So right away, I can bound this probability and like prevent myself from making mistakes. Even once we get to Excel, if I enter something in Excel wrong, I can very quickly realize oh, I did something wrong there. Right? And I didn't know just from the concept, this has to be less than 0.5. So the next step is we need to turn these two values into z scores. Now, before I use the formula on this one, it should be you should be able to tell me very quickly what the z value should be for that value of 10 and 15. Remember, the z score for the z value is the number of standard deviations away from the mean that those values are. My standard deviation is five. My mean is five. What should the z score be for 10? How many standard deviations away from the mean? Is it's five away from the mean. Standard deviation is five, so one. Right? These are nice, easy numbers. They won't always be this easy. But then look at the value of 15. <laughs> How far away from the mean is that? Not sure question. 10. How many standard deviations is that? Five goes to 10 two times, right? So I have a z-score of two there. Yeah. Uh, can you go through how you get from one to two real quick? Yeah, so remember, what's the definition of a z-score? It's the number of standard deviations away from the mean that that x value is. So when I'm thinking about the x value of 10, how far away is it from the mean? Well, the difference between 10 and 5 is 5. How many standard deviations is that? Well, if the standard deviation is 5, then 5 away from the mean would just be one so standard just, deviation away. You just divided by yeah. the difference. Yeah. All right. Once I know the standard deviation, especially if it's nice numbers like this, I'm just thinking about, okay, how far away am I from the mean? How many times would the standard deviation fit into that gap? Right? Now, the more technical way to do it, where you don't, if the numbers aren't as easy, right, then I'm taking 
this equation where say for the value of five, I'll take, oh, I'm sorry, for the value of 10, my bad. For that value of 10, that's the X value I'm interested in. The mean we were told was five, and that standard deviation was also five. If I enter this in my cal calculator, sure enough, I get the same thing as if I just kind of conceptually thought about this one, which is that it's one standard deviation or whatever. And then same thing for the value of 15. There, my mean and my standard deviation are the same. I'm just looking at a different value for X. If I plug those values in my calculator way and the finding out for something conceptually, that's two standard deviations away, or Z value two. Yep. Everybody's leading me up to this point. All right. So this is a slightly different way. Um, and I'll try to remember these values. So I have to now look up a Z value of one and two. Okay. So where did I have these pulled up here? So if I'm looking up kind of an integer, the decimals associated with it are actually zero, zero, okay? So 1.00 0 is right here, right? The area to the left of that, or the probability I see something that's one standard deviation away from the mean, or anything below that is 0.8413, okay? So this area was what? 0.8413. Area to the left of one. I then need to look up my next z value, which was two. I'm going to have to scroll down a little bit here. Hopefully, I can keep this all on, on the screen for us. But this is why I said, okay, well, remember this first column is zero because I can't keep it all on the screen. So I'm going to have to go down here. 2.00 would be right here. The probability I see something two standard deviations below. Or anything further is what? I already forgot. 0.9772. Now, what's the only other step that I need to do here? Yeah, I wanted the probability being in between these, like drawing it out, help me remember. Oh, yeah, what do I do with these probabilities? I'll take that larger probability, subtract the smaller one from it. And what? One, two, three, five, nine. If I'm looking at this correct. I think I told you something last class, but I want to use this idea since we are looking up Z values that are integers here, like one and two. I wanted to kind of point out something that I told you last class that I told you just to believe me. Um, I would try to show it to you today. So let's say I wanted to know the probability that I saw something within one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. Last class, I told you that that's always going to be a probability of, and I think if I can remember it off in my head right, it's 0.683. Right, or about a 68.3% chance, I see something within one standard deviation above and below the mean. Well, how can I prove that that's true? If I have something that is one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below the mean, what would those Z values be? I mean, that's literally the definition. Would it be zero? So zero, right, would have to be if I was looking at the mean. Yeah. Because the definition of my z value is just the number of standard deviations away from the mean that I am. So to have a z value of zero, I'd have to be zero away from the mean, which would literally mean I have to be the same as the mean. Yeah. If I see something that is a standard deviation below the mean, how many standard deviations mm -hmm. below the mean is that? Negative one. Or it's one standard deviation below, which would be a z value of negative one. Right? It's one standard deviation below the mean. What if I had a value that's one standard deviation above the mean? Well, that's a z value of positive one. Okay. So I could then look those up in the table. We already looked up positive one. That was probably seeing that or anything below it was 0.8413. Now, the area that we wanted was what's in between these two. 
So what do I need to do? Find the area to the left of negative one and then subtract it from that larger area. So I could look up negative one up in this table, right? What's another way actually, well, I'll look up negative one and then I'll kind of ask that second question. Sorry, I, I might jump the gun a little bit there. So let's look up negative one. So negative 1.0, that first column is zero. So 0 0.1587, 0 0.1587. If I then subtract, that smaller probability from the larger probability, what I end up with is what, 0 0.6, 8, what would that be, 7, 4, right? Or approximately 68.3%, right? So that's where that came from. It was because we know that if we're ever one standard deviation above or below the mean, those are going to be Z values of one and negative one, when I look up one and negative one on the table, I'm always going to find the same two probabilities. So the difference between those same two probabilities will always be that 68.3%. And I could kind of go it's through 60, this. It's 68 to 26. 68. What was it? Dr. 26. All right. Thank you. Mental math is not always my forte. So, right? Same idea, though. Approximately 68.3%. Okay. So you could do this with two standard deviations and three and kind of prove to yourself that whatever those probabilities I put in the slides actually are what it will always be, but that's where it comes from, okay? Now, I looked up the Z value of negative one to find this 0.1587. If I knew the probability of being to the left of positive one was 0.8413, how could I have used that instead of using the table to find this area? I'll draw this out here, maybe it'll make more sense. So let's say I just looked up that Z value of positive one, right? And I found that from the table, the probability that I see that Z value of positive one or anything below it, right, was 0 0.8413. And then I asked you, okay, given that information, what's the probability that you see a Z value less than negative one. So how could I find that without using the table? So it won't be 0.683, right? That's gonna be the problem I'm in between, but I could actually arrive to that value as well. So what I'll first start doing is thinking about, okay, if this is a symmetric distribution, the Z value, the z value, sorry, have a mean of zero. And they're supposed to be symmetric around that mean. So if I fold this in half, one is going to lay on top of negative one. So whatever this area is should be the same as this area. Right? How can I find this area? Yeah, I know the probability being less than one is 0.8413. The probability of being above that would just be one minus that. So I now, I know this area is 0.587. Because it's a symmetric distribution, I automatically know that area to the left of negative one has to be 0.1587 as well. So sometimes instead of using this table over and over every single time, you can kind of use what we've already done. And the idea that this is a symmetric distribution kind of finds some of those areas. Any questions on, on any of this before we keep moving? We'll go through a couple of different games. So I know this is a lot, but hopefully just more practice, kind of going through more of these will, will help. So we already did all this. Uh, we turned these into Z values. We looked those areas up in the table, right? 0 0.9772, 0 0.843. Subtract them from each other, and we kind of got that 0.13. So this is just stuff we did up on the board. The next example we're going to do is look at Indiana temperature in the rainfall. Oh, maybe there we go. So if we look at rainfall, and I've got the Excel data we'll look at here in a second, it's pretty normally distributed. Right? And we easily calculate if we've got the data, the average monthly rainfall. And I think I put 2012 here. I believe I updated this. I think I got all the way up to 2019 or 2020. I forget how far I was able to get it. Um, but that's I guess a, a little bit just an aside. Um, and I can calculate the mean of the variance of rainfall. Right? 
I could also then look at the distribution. Oh, it looks like it's normally distributed. So I've got everything I need to start to think about, well, what's the probability I see average rainfall this next year be above three inches, right? And this is very applicable if I'm especially working like the agricultural sector, right? I might really want to know the different probabilities of seeing certain amounts of rainfall, okay? Um, you can also break this down by month. You know, if I'm thinking about once again the agricultural sector where it's really the rainfall within the certain months that you're concerned about, um, you can break it down and sure enough, you know, if you look at within month rainfall, it looks even closer to a normal distribution, right? If you just kind of stay within the same month. So once we have the mean or the average and the variance, we look at it, it's normally distributed. We can start to do things like, I'll skip this and come back. What's the probability that we see average monthly rainfall be less than 1.3 inches, given that we can calculate the mean is 3.4 and that we know the variance is 2.57. So that's kind of sort of behind the questions we can answer, right? We can figure out what's the probability this next year we get less than an inch and a third, or not an inch and a third, I guess 1.3 inches of rain. Maybe that's like a threshold for a for, um, certain type of crop production, right? So if that probability is high, we have to have a backup plan, right? Have somehow to irrigate, irrigate the field. So go back. Kind of also the setup I have here is in 2012 there was like pretty extreme drought. Um, I don't know. I stole this from some government organization. Just kind of they had we had very little rainfall. The temperatures were relatively high, but it was really that there was almost no rain kind of in the, in the spring or early summer. So you can kind of look. It's it's interesting. Just like a timeline. Um, you look here, like February to June, you get this nice spike in rainfall. Uh, usually rainfall goes. Kind of a little bit lower in the winter. Once again, 2010, we see another spike in February and June rainfall. It kind of goes back down. Another spike in 2011, kind of goes back down. Then we get to 2012. Not only do we not see a spike, it actually kind of goes down even a little bit more, right? So it's not, you know, it looks like usually it's cyclical. We usually see rain in these months be a little bit higher. In 2012, it just didn't happen at all, right? That spike didn't occur. So how unlikely was it that we saw as little of rainfall as we did in 2012 or something even lower? So that's the setup, right? So what we're going to do is, okay, we've got this normally distributed variable. Call this X. So we've got what? Kind of think about X, which is representing rainfall here. It's normally distributed. We're told it has a mean of what, 3.4 and a variance of 2.57. If anybody wants to help me out, just maybe make this a little bit easier to think about. What's the square root of 2.57? Okay, so it's going to 1.16? Sounds about right. So we'll say it's about 1.60. So if I'm thinking about then what's the probability I see 1.3 inches of rainfall or anything below that? Okay. Right away, I know this probability should be less than what? Yeah, 0.5. Why? <clears throat> because the way I'm drawing it, they're not. Well, there's the, uh, yeah. Well, you're right. <laughs> Is the same answer as the one before? Yeah, right. You know that the area to the left of the mean, this is going to be 0. 0.5. Well, I'm looking for something much smaller than that, so it has to be less than 0. 0.5. It, it, it. Um, I also know that when I go to turn this into a z value, what's going to be true about that <laughs> z value? That's Maybe more than negative one. <clears throat> I was looking for a little bit less, but you're right. And we'll talk about why I'm saying it. But all I was say, thinking about initially was, well, I know the mean is going to have a Z value of zero. And I'm going to be a certain number of standard deviations below the mean. So I know this has to be negative. Okay. Now, I can actually say it's even smaller, right? It's less than negative one. Why? Well, because if I look at the standard deviation, I am just under what? About 2.9 away no actually sorry i'm 3.1 right no why am i not there i can't do this all right 2.1 right 
How far away is 1.3 from 3.4? 2.1, right? So I'm 2.1 away from the mean. If the standard deviation is 1.6, that's going to be more than the standard deviation below. So that's why kind of calculating that standard deviation can kind of just help you like, you're not going to get the exact Z value there, but you're going to be able to think about like about what it's going to be. So I know that this should be something less than negative one, right? A larger negative value. Now, from there, I actually have to use my Z-score equation to calculate the exact answer. So I'll go ahead and I'll do that. And I just happen to get this kind of weird scenario where the value for X just happens to be pretty close to the Z value. That's just coincidence here, right? Just happened to be the way the numbers with the mean, I used the actual data. So this is a little bit odd, but it can happen, right? Um, no, they're not exactly the same. But they're really so we've got this Z value. The next step is I'm going to go to my standard normal table and I'm going to look up that Z value of negative 1.31. So just to remind myself here, because I can't keep it all in the same. <clears throat> the second decimal I had was one, right? So 0 0.01. So I'm going to be in this second column. My first decimal was negative 1.3. So 0 0.0951. So if I'm drawing this out to help give myself a visualization, I'm thinking about the area that I find in the table is always the area to the left of whatever Z value I look up. I already forgot what this was. What's it? Okay, 0 0.0531. Well, this one's kind of easy. I just wanted the probability I saw rainfall be less than this value. So I don't have any other steps. Right, that's what the table told me. All right, so I'm done. Right? So I found that the probability that you would see rainfall be as low as it was in 2012 there's still about like a 9% chance you saw it be that low or anything lower, all right? So not the smallest probability, but also not very high either. All right, so I think what I'm gonna have you guys do, so we looked that up in the table. So hopefully you guys can have, have these in front of you um, or these tables, or at least someone around you does, so you can kind of work with each other. So what I want you to do, is think about instead you're looking at September rainfall and you can calculate the mean, which is 3.25. You've got the variance, which is 2.37, similar to the last one you're given the variance. And you want to know what's the probability that you saw uh, monthly rainfall this last September be what? 0.47 inches or lower. Okay. So same sort of setup, just kind of some different values. I just want to see uh, if you guys can kind of work through these. And hopefully um, we're all we're all kind of getting getting the correct answer here. So I'll give you a little bit of time to work on this, talk to the people around you, and then we'll kind of come together and talk about it. Can you for it? So the form of that the only formula that you should need here, right, is this converting your x value, which is that 0.47 inches, into a z value. Okay, thanks. Right? From there, once you have that Z value, you can use that table, that Z table that is up on Canvas to kind of find what's the probability I saw that Z score or anything below it. Where are the X values? All right, so what X value are we interested in here? Oh, you're 147. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh, <laughs> did I not give you? Oh, I, I think I accidentally deleted these when I was creating the skeleton slides. So, at least it was good that you were starting to work on these and then we can kind of talk about it. So everybody should get this one correct. So just everybody answer A, right? I forgot. I so, so there's no answers up there. And then I, I think I must have accidentally deleted them when I was creating the skeleton slides. 
So make sure you get a response in. Just select A, or I guess really select whatever letter you, you, you want to, but kind of here, I'll give everybody, everyone's basically a credit for this, okay? So make sure you get a response when you right clickers, and then we'll kind of talk through it, and hopefully you are at least on the right approach, okay? So there's 15 of us here. I thought I counted more. 9, 12, 15, 16, 17. So everybody made sure they got a response in. I think there's two of you that didn't. I want to make sure that you're, you didn't show up today for no reason here. 16. All right. Maybe someone forgot and kind of tell me after class. Okay. All right. I'm going to close it out. So, oops, here we go. So how am I going to approach this one? The first thing I was doing it is always draw it out, right? We just worked through a problem that's very, very similar, okay? So if I were to draw this out, I've got this normally distributed variable, which is rainfall in September. And it's normally distributed around what value? 3.25, the variance is 2.37. Once again, something that might make this easier is to calculate the standard deviation. If I do that, I get about what? 1.54, okay. So I then say, okay, what's the probability you saw 0.47 inch, inches of rainfall or anything less, all right? The next step is I need to convert that into a Z value. How do I do that? I take that value, I subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. So if I plug in, what, 0.47, subtract the mean of 3.25, and then divide by that standard deviation, I get approximately what? Sounds about right, negative 1.81. Now, I could kind of eyeball this. I was like, what? Uh, a little less, about 2.7 away. Okay, that's not quite two standard deviations, right? Two standard deviations would be a little bit above three here. So I should be just under two standard deviations. Sure enough, once I plug everything in, I'm 1.8 standard deviations away, or 1.8 standard deviations below that mean. I then look that value up in my table, right? And then I'm done because that's the probability I wanted. You know, if I'm seeing good value or anything below it. Okay. Now, based off what we did before, what do I know that probability has to be less than? Not just zero. I can actually say that it's less than. Or, sorry, I said zero. Um, I was thinking of the mean as zero. I can say that it's less than 0.5, but based off what we did in the previous problem, I can actually say it's less than another value. So it has to be less than 0 0.0951. Why? Well, what Z value did that find? Negative 1.81. If I'm moving further into that tail or further away from the mean, it's becoming less and less likely I see those values, right? The further away I get from the mean or the larger in absolute value that Z score is, because if it's negative, right, it's like, actually getting smaller because a larger negative value is actually less, but the idea is that it's larger in magnitude, right? That is becoming a larger negative value. So as I move further from that mean, a higher number of standard deviations away, well, that area to the left is just going to become smaller and smaller. So I know for sure it's going to be less than what we found before. Now, we don't always have a problem that we worked on prior to the one that we did, so we may not always be able to bound things like that, but right, we're up to the point where we calculate that Z value and I can find that probability from my table. So negative 1.81, see if I can get this. So the second decimal there, 0 0.01, negative 1.8, 0 0.0351 should be that area to the left, right? Yep, so we'll always, once we get to this step where you're calculating the Z value, you always have to round to the second decimal because when we go to that table to look up that probability, the table's constrained to two decimals, right? If we want to go out to three decimals, we'd have to have like a three-dimensional table then to go out to like whatever the third decimal is, and that's impossible. <laughs> um, but we can do this in Excel and be a lot more precise. 
Okay. So I think I'll probably have a little bit of time to show you how to do this in Excel today. I think I got one more example that I want to work through. Um, and then I'll kind of jump in Excel and see how we do this. So there we're kind of done. We didn't have any transformation to do here because the table gave us the exact area we wanted. Okay. So let's now kind of move away from rainfall and look at temperatures. Right? And actually, this was uh, so this is a pretty low probability. This was 2018. I think September rainfall was this low, so it probably was as low as it was, about three percent. Uh, you can go into this with any month and any year kind of air rainfall you're interested in. Um, you can also do it with temperature. So temperature follows a pretty nice normal distribution. So we'll kind of work through uh, an example, I think, of that. And um, actually, I might just kind of have you guys work through it. Uh, it doesn't say I can question here, but I want to see kind of how we're grasping this. So this one, you will actually have the answer. You won't everyone just get full credit for, for kind of being here. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of time to work on this. Talk to the people around you. So it's a similar setup. But we now have that, we have this normally distributed variable, which is June temperature, and the mean is 70.75, and the variance is 6.3, okay? So what's the probability that you see June temperature this next month be greater than 71.4? So unlike the other two problems, we're no longer looking for the problem of being less than a certain amount. We now have the probability of being greater than that amount. Okay. So, you can kind of subtract. So, there might be an added step. Yep. You might have to have a step at the end. Once you look that probability up in the table, there's going to be one additional step. So, I'll give you guys a little bit of time to work on this and we'll kind of come together and talk through this one. Also, if you draw this out, it should help you limit the possible answers down a little bit as well. Ten seconds here, start wrapping it up. Okay. 
All right. If you haven't gotten an answer in, take your best guess here. Once again, I'm sure you're getting your response in. I thought there was 17. I know we had 16 before. All right, there we go. Okay, so I'm going to close this out. So I'm going to kind of walk through this one together. So <clears throat> if I were starting out, so I always kind of draw it out first. So what's my mean temperature in June? Well, that was that, was it 70.75? My variance was 6.3, which I don't have to find this, but that was my standard deviation. Anybody do that step? It was 2.51. Sounds about right. So how did I do that? Well, just the square root of the variance, right? So if I'm thinking about then, what's the probability I see 71.4 or greater, right? Automatically, what two answers can I rule out then? The area to the right of the mean is 0.5. So I'm going to have to have something less than 0.5, right? So right away, I can rule out these answers. Now, from there, I don't know if it's A or D. Now, the more that we we kind of go through these problems. If I'm looking at this, if my standard deviation is 2.5 and I'm only what, 0.65 away from the mean here? I mean, that's not even a fourth of a standard deviation. I mean, or maybe it's around a fourth of a standard deviation. So I'm not very many standard deviations away at all. So if I was just guessing, this probability should be a little bit closer to 0.5 than it is to zero. So if I was guessing, I would think it's probably going to be A, right? But I really can't say that for sure without working through the problem. Right? So the next step is I need to convert that value of 71.4 into a Z value. So just a reminder, we'll take that value, subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. So 71.4 minus 70.75 divided by 2.51 gives me what? I remember this is 0.26. So everyone's not in their heads, so I must be remembering this correctly. All right. Is zero to 262? Or no. Yep. So so about 0.26. Remember, whenever we come up with this Z value, we're gonna have to round to the second decimal, right? Because once we go to the table, we can only look it up to that second decimal spot. So then I go to my standard normal table. That Z value is 0.26. So I'm going to scroll down here. Oops, scroll a little bit too far. 0.26, right? So 0 0.6026. But remember, this is where if I start out and draw this, remember, this area has to be less than 0.5. I don't just answer 0 0.6026 because I have to remember there's one more step, which is if I want the area to the right, I still need to subtract that from one, right? And once I subtract that from one, I get that 0 0.39, whatever it was, 0 0.3974. Okay. And I think I kind of have this not as well, well kind of uh, laid out as I do on the slides, but or on the uh, the board, but here's kind of the slide. How we let me go through and work this out. Yeah. I uh, types of questions where you have to subtract from one. So to be completely honest, the easiest way to do that is draw them out. When it wants the probability being less than something, right away, slot that point, shade the area to the left of it, right? Or the area that's less than that. If I want the probability being greater than a certain value, draw it out, shade the area to the right. Right. And that kind of helps me remember if I'm looking for that area to the right, the table always gives me the area to the left. So I'm going to have an additional step that I need to do. Does that, yeah, that make sense? sense? It'll say greater than one. Yeah. Time. Right. So, like in this one, right, what's probably so greater than that 71.4 degrees? Questions on this? Yeah. 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 Okay. With that for now. So I think I've got an extra question here that I'm not going to necessarily go through. Um, but it was kind of just, a, I don't know, kind of interesting. 
This was the actual temperature in February of 2017. And if you work it out, there was like a 0.3% chance that it was actually that warm uh, that year. I honestly, some t- I, there hasn't been any like extreme weather r- recently in terms of rain or temperature, but I usually try to choose a relevant one. Where I'm like, it seems like it's been really warm this this last month. Like how, how likely was that? And I you can go back, grab the historical data. You could do this with every month you're interested in. So that's what we're going to do. So I, on Canvas, close out of that Z table. Under this in-class data folder, there should be an Indiana weather blank file. Okay. So I'm going to pull that open and we'll do a little bit of work in this. We probably won't finish it all today. We'll kind of come back to it on Wednesday, Um, but we can at least kind of start thinking about how we could do some of this work in Excel makes our life quite a bit easier. I think we'll see today. Okay. So the first part I kind of cheated on because we've already done it and I didn't want to waste too much time with it, but here you can see, I've got three different and actually let me get rid of these. Let's change this to August, and then I can kind of show you what I did here. All right. So here all I did was take the average of this June temperature column. Right. So that should give me the mean, and just to label this maybe to make it a little bit easier, it should be the mean June temperature. And then this is the mean July temperature. Now, if I drag this over all the way over, right, June, July, August, well, that's how I had the original data set up. So when I drag this over one, notice that column H becomes column I and then becomes column J, right? It kind of keeps updating. So I've got the mean now of these three months temperature. Okay. I've got here, if I look in here, this is going to give me the variance. So once again, I'll kind of throw a label on here just so we can think about this a little bit easier. Here's my variance. And then down here, I took the square root of the variance. So that should give me my what? Yeah, square root of the variance, right? That's just my standard deviation. And I'll copy these over so I can get it for the other months as well, okay? And I'm going to relabel this. I don't know why I skipped August. I think I, I probably was was just not thinking. So I've got these three different months. Um, I've got their means. I've got their variances. I've got their standard deviations. So this is all temperature data. So let me see if I've got this. Oh, did I have temperature on here? I've got rainfall. Uh, I, I can, I'll, I'll bring one next class, but you can kind of see here. Where is it? There it is. Right. Rainfall, very close to a nice normal distribution. If we graph kind of monthly temperatures. They look pretty close to a normal distribution as well. So we'll treat these like it's their normal distributions. Right. So here I've got three different cutoff values. Notice one of them actually lines up with the problem that we just worked through, 71.4. Um, so I can in Excel do it one of two ways. So I'll show you the harder way for, I shouldn't say harder, the longer way first, but there's a reason why I'm showing it to you because the function that we'll use will end up using down the road, okay? So the first way we're going to do is just make Excel be our calculator, All right? So how do I calculate Z values? I take the X value, I'm interested in finding the probability of seeing that or anything below it, subtract the mean for that variable. Well, now I'm looking at June temperature, so I'll select the mean of June temperature. And then I'll take that difference and divide it by my standard deviation. All I'm doing is having Excel do that Z-score calculation math for me, right? So just no no built-in formula, just using Excel to be my calculator. Okay. And also I can, it's kind of nice if I do this, I can play around with different cutoff values and updates, right? But I'll change it back to what we originally had. Okay. Any questions over that? You want to see a cell again or shouldn't, shouldn't be too tough yet. So I could copy this over and it will kind of update my cell references to kind of look at the next month's right? Just so I could do this very quickly. Um, now I'll kind of notice here, like this cutoff value is not near as many standard deviations away from that mean, right? 71.4 is pretty close to 70.8. Well, this cutoff value of 70, or I'm sorry, 80.1, that's about a little more than five away from, from the mean of July temperature. Standard deviations are somewhat similar. So it's a, a higher number of standard deviations away. Okay. 
So I don't know, just kind of re, you know saying things out loud just so we hear them over and over. But these are my Z values now, right? These are the number of standard deviations away that I am. So usually at this point, if I wanted the probability of seeing a certain Z value or anything below it, well, I've already turned my X values into these Z values. I could look these up in the table, right? I would look up what? 0.21, I go look that up in the table, right? However, I don't have a table in Excel, but I do have a table that's kind of built into it, right? So if I use the norm.s.dist function, it kind of tells me, all right, tell me the Z value you're interested in. And then comma, we're always going to use a one. So what this does, is it tells itself, hey, I've got a standard normal distribution. I want you to find the area to the left, right? The cumulative probability of seeing this Z value or anything below it. Now, what it actually does, it's not like it has this built-in table. It actually is integrating that function from your Z value to negative infinity, right? But that's exactly, that's what the table was doing, right? So never put a comma zero here. So when I see someone turning the Excel homework in, inevitably someone might put a comma zero here. That really tells us nothing. In fact, if a one zero in that second spot tells me if I want it to be cumulative or not cumulative, really what should it return to me if I put a zero in here? If I want to know the probability of any one value from a continuous distribution, it should be zero. So it's kind of this weird counterintuitive result. The problem is they have this kind of written so that it takes like an infinitesimally small area and then returns you. has no use for us in this class. We're always going to use this as a cumulative density function. Okay. So I'll hit enter. And sure enough, the probability is what, about 0.585? Now, if I had to round this to 0.21, and I looked it up on the table myself, 0 0.21, 0.5832, well, notice I had to round my Z value to the second decimal so I couldn't quite be as precise, and I get an answer that just varies just a little bit. Now, this doesn't matter much, right, unless we're dealing with something that's in, like, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, like, I don't know revenues or profits, right? And so, you know, being off at the third decimal is still a pretty big deal. You know, we're, we're dealing with, uh, you know, large sums of money here. Um, and not as, not as big of a deal when we're talking about temperatures, those gaps are a little bit smaller, but, but still Excel allows us to be more precise. Okay. So I could do that for each month here as well. And it kind of makes sense, right? Well, this is barely any standard deviations above the mean. So the probability should be fairly close to 0.5, right? If I was looking at values that were barely above the mean, then that area is going to be pretty close to 0.5. The further I get away from that mean, well, now the area to the left is going to get closer and closer to 1, right? The entire area under the curve. So if I look at these Z values as they get higher, well, the probability of seeing that Z value or anything to the left is also quite a bit higher. Notice if the Z value then goes down a little bit, well, that probability falls a little bit. Right? So this is kind of, you know, we see all the things we talked about played out with when using this, this formula. Um, this is a lot easier, I think, than like using it, the, the table by hand. Um, although it requires that I use that norm.s.dish formula directly and get my t-score calculations correct as well. Any questions on this for key moving? So, what is an easier way of doing this? Um, and I say easier, there's things we can do in Excel where we start black boxing more stuff. So here I calculated the z-score and then looked it up on a standard normal distribution. I've also got a function, which is just norm.dist, right? Which says, okay, what are the three things that I need when I start a problem to find the probability that I want? Well, I'm going to need the X value I'm interested in. I need to know the mean of my normally distributed variable. And I need to know the standard deviation. So if I had a written, a program written in Excel that took those three things, converted them into a Z value, looked that Z value up in the table, and then spits back out of me the area to the left, it's doing all the steps for me. But if I could tell it those three things, hopefully someone wrote a function that it could do that. Sure enough, that's the norm.dist function. 
I'll tell it that cutoff value X I'm interested in, comma, what's the mean, comma, what's my standard deviation. Once again, we'll always treat it as though it's cumulative. So just like the tables, this norm.dist and norm.s.dist can only ever give me the area to the left. Okay. So if it, you know, some, I told you all this, it's going to do all this behind the scenes, calculate the z-score. We're never going to see it. It's going to look it up in that standard normal distribution function. I should get the exact same value I did before. Sure enough, I do. Okay. And then if I wanted to kind of copy this over, play around with different, oops, cutoff values for these other months, you know, I could do, I could do that, right? Or whatever values I'm interested in. Okay. So any questions kind of over anything there? So this is like, uh, I think I have a, another section of this class and someone was like, well, why would I ever use the norm.s.dist, right? I'm just creating more work for myself. And this the short answer is in practice, you never would, right? Just use the norm.dist function. It saves yourself a lot of, a lot of work. Well, no, I shouldn't say a lot, but it saves you a little bit of work, right? Calculating the intermediate step, which is that Z value. Um, the reason why I show you the other way a, it's kind of a nice check just to make sure you're entering everything incorrectly. And it also lines up with kind of more what we're doing by hand, right? It doesn't black box as much of it, right? You can actually say, oh, yeah, I calculated the Z value and then use this, this formula that kind of acted like the table. But also down the road for confidence intervals and stuff uh, like that, uh, hypothesis testing confidence intervals, we're going to end up using this norm.s.dist function again. So I wanted to introduce it at this point, okay? Any other questions before we keep moving here? So what if I wanted the probability of being greater than these cutoffs? What's the only added thing I should have to do here? Yep. And I just wanted to kind of show you, you don't have to do this in steps, right? I could do one minus and then just select this here, but I can actually do all that, like I can do math and use built-in formulas all within the same cell. So notice I could do one minus, select my cutoff value, select my mean, select my standard deviation, make it cumulative. I can use that norm.dist function and then subtract it from one all in the same cell if I wanted to find the probability of being above a certain value, okay? Any questions on that? Um, I'm going to cut this right now because we're not going to use this anymore. And I'm going to show you a couple. Well, what do I want to do? I'll show you two th different things. Uh, the one is more so just like I always like to introduce you to things you can do in Excel, even if we're not expected to do them in this class. Um, like I said, because I know employers and down the road, it may be helpful to kind of look into these things. Um, but up to this point, we've always, whenever I copy cells and want the cell references to stay the same, I always froze both the row and the column heading, right? Sometimes you don't always want the row heading to change, but you might want the column heading to change when you copy it. So what I can actually do, I actually built my own standard normal distribution table here, right? So what I, I how could I do that? Well, this first value would be a Z value of, negative 4.0. So if I added this to this, right, get negative 4.0. So I would just kind of um, had this complicated way of doing this, right? But I'm adding those two values together and then throwing them into that norm.s.dist function. So this is going to return to me the probability of being negative four or anything below that. Now, notice here I froze that column heading, but not the row. So that when I copy this over, I'm still using the same first decimal value, right? But the second decimal value, because I didn't have that column reference frozen, it updated to my next column, right? Now, I'm not expecting you to understand like exactly, like I'm not expecting you to use this, but I wanted to let you know, like you can freeze just the column or just the row settings. And then, I've got this if statement, which we'll actually use later on this semester, not quite as complicated as I did here. Um, but this is like, I'm checking to see if something's true. 
And the reason why I had to do that here is because when I'm dealing with negative values, I actually can't add these two values together <laughs> because it's negative 4.02. I'm actually like subtracting, right? Because it's a larger negative value. But basically you can use that if statement, you can freeze these different column settings. I really only had to type this in one time. Like I'll just kind of show you. So if I go over here, select all that, select, oh, not select it. I wanted to delete it. There we go. So let's say I entered this in one time. So basically I froze my column and cell references so that when I'm copying it over here, the column doesn't change on this reference, but it changes on the others. Once again, when I copy it down the rows, this row reference won't change, but it allows this cell reference row to change. So what should be true is when I copy this over and down, if I've done it correctly, it should give me the probability to the left or the area to the left of each one of these. And also nice shortcut. If I double left click on this, it'll copy it down to the last cell that I had data on. So that would have been all the way down here, right? And one way I can kind of verify that this is working is, well, at the very least, all my positive Z values have areas to the left that are greater than 0.5. All of my negative Z values have areas to the left that are less than negative point, or sorry, less than 0.5. And these negative Z values, as they get larger in magnitude or like larger negative values, notice this probability is getting closer and closer to zero. And then as I'm looking at really, really large Z values, those probabilities are getting pretty close to one. Right? So just kind of showing you, you know, you can push things in Excel pretty far, um, has some pretty wide, you know, pretty nice capabilities where I only had to type that function once. And if I can logically think about it correctly, I can make my entire Z table there. Okay. Now, back in the day, you would have to like do the integration for every single one of these values. Uh, now, you know, we can kind of do it pretty quickly. Okay. So the other thing I will show you, maybe this speaks about who I am as a person, but um, so back in, oh, what year was it? I already forgot now, 20 something, 26, would have been the year, two years before they won the World Series. The Cubs had, I think it was, what, what value do they have in here? Uh, 97 wins, right? And they got third place in their division. I was like, most years, 97 wins. You're not a baseball fan, doesn't matter. That's a lot of wins. That should win you your division almost every like almost every year, right? So it's like, how unlikely was it? Not only that they didn't win their division, but that they actually got third with that many wins. So I went out and gathered all this. Uh, since there's been 162 games, you can get the number of wins that the first place person, second place person, and third place person had every single year. What ends up being true? Let me see. I think I threw this in the slides here is that that number of wins is pretty close to a normally distributed variable, right? A little bit off, but pretty close. So I could treat this like a normally distributed variable. I can very easily calculate, for instance, for um, third place, I can find the mean number of wins that the third place person had in that central division. I can also find the variance on that number of wins. I took the square root here. That gives me my standard deviation. I then went over here and said, okay, what's the probability if I got 97 wins and the average is 81.7, the standard deviation is 3.8, what's the probability that if I had 97 wins or fewer that I end up kind of in third place, which is – really, really close to one, right? If I win less than kind of, if I win 97 games or fewer, it's almost guaranteed that I'm at least in third place. But if I want to know what's the probability that I am not in third place, right? Or above that it would actually be one minus that, or sorry, I actually did between 98, 95 and 97, right? So I said, what's the problem if I win between 97, 95 games, that I would actually end up in third place. Well, that would just be the gap or the area in between the two. You can prove that's as low as 0 0.0002, right? Or very, very unlikely, right? And you can do this with like first place wins and things like that as well. Um, but this kind of shows as long as you can find a normally distributed variable, you can start to play around with like, well, how likely or unlikely was that I saw this variable take on these certain values, right? 
One more thing I'll mention. I mentioned a little bit earlier in the class, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, it maybe allows us to think about things in the world a little bit different. So I had this powerlifting data. I took one, I think actually, I think I said it was deadlift here. I'm pretty sure this is like total weight lifted and three different movements. But you can kind of see here that the male average is a little bit above 500. The female average is about 300. So there's a pretty significant gap. They're both normally distributed, but the mean is much higher for male kind of weightlifting performance, right? So, you know, the naive person would say, well, uh, men are so much stronger, right? Well, I always had this idea that like, you could get a male and a female that they were the exact same height and had the exact same build, the exact same amount of muscle mass. Muscle fibers are muscle fibers, right? They should be exactly the same strength, right? So if I just account for one thing, which is the weight lifted and divided by their body weight, it should give me kind of a per pound of body weight. So I can't factor height in because I didn't have that data, but I had weights. So I just took the total amount they lifted divided by their body weight. Because there's a lot more 300 plus pound men in the data than there were 300 plus pound women, right? And so once you do that, it's called something called Wilt score. It's kind of like the per pound body weight that you lift, right? So how much you lift per pound of body weight. Well, now if we look at these averages, this is what 350-ish. This is gonna be maybe a little bit above 350, but then I think if I break these actual values, they're less than 10 apart. So once you just account for body mass, Basically, men and women have like the exact same kind of distribution of, of being able to, you know, weight lifted. If you want to think about that way. And my guess would be if I had height data and we could somehow factor in height, we'd end up with even more of a kind of identical distribution. This is kind of a nice application of thinking about statistics, thinking about this normal distribution, seeing it pop up again. I've taken enough of your time here. They're probably ready to get out of here. It's going to start getting dark towards the end of the semester now in this class. We'll get out of here at 515. So I will see you guys on Wednesday. Try to start on that connect assignment. I'll probably throw the next Excel assignment up there. You won't be able to get too far into it based on what we did today. But after Wednesday's class, you really should be able to get a pretty good chunk of it done. All right. See you guys on Wednesday.